we're still in an experiment when people are scientifically minded and they want to study things you have to understand it's a process like i was taught that my whole life because science is never settled it's never settled i am a husband a father a lawyer a christian and a proud canadian i started this series because it was clear that our nation needs truth not just another biased narrative, but real information of substance. We need access to facts and the freedom to think for ourselves. I'm Leighton Gray, and this is Gray Matter. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Gray Matter. Well, I'm often uh, I receive uh, correspondence from people. Uh, usually, it's supportive. When it is supportive, I'm often asked, uh, "Where is everyone else? Where are all the freedom fighters?" Well, you know what? We're out here. I'm not the only one. There are many of us. And the lady we have in the program today uh, is doing a lot in that, in that sphere. And so we're going to talk to her about her involvement in the quote-unquote freedom movement and also some very, very interesting work that she's doing with examining blood and what the COVID-19 vaccines are doing to our blood. Her name is Dr. Lana Nickel. Welcome to the program. Thanks, Dr. Layton. Thanks for having me. Yes, I'm very excited to have you on. Your Twitter bio is, is very interesting. It says, I'm a mother of four children, Métis heritage, proud wife, doctor of chiropractic over 20 years, author of a children's health book, and Canadian Alberta Hall of Fame athlete. You're, you're a volleyball superstar, Grant McEwen, and uh, also a certified blood microscopist. And here's the best part. According to at Justin Trudeau, I'm a racist and take up space. <laughs> Trudeau <laughs> uh, backslash Trudeau must go. Or, sorry, sorry. Hashtag Trudeau must go. That's uh, that's one of the best ones I've read. Bravo. Really good. <laughs> Thank you. Well, yes, I come from a very diverse background. That's for sure. So, <laughs> so I understand that um, you're originally from the Edmonton area. Your, your, your father was... Uh, the mayor of Shore Park growing up. I'm originally from Edmonton, so we probably grew up around the same around the same time. And uh, but you got to meet uh, some really interesting uh, people like uh, Peter Elzinga, or Brian Mulroney, and uh, Pierre Trudeau. How, how did how did being part of a of a, of a family where your 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 father was a mayor? How did that kind of shape your upbringing and your outlook on life? Yeah, you know, looking back on it now, it is just so strange. At the time, it was just my reality. So, you know, I had a father who was very much in the public light. Uh, you know, I saw him public speaking. You know, for me, it was just that's something you do. Uh, you talk to lots of people. Uh, but then I also, you know, he, he had very, very strong ethics and values. He came from a social worker background. He actually worked with uh, troubled teens and suicidal teens. So that's what he was doing prior to going into politics. Uh, but yeah, it was a very interesting time because I did get to meet some interesting players now looking back in Canadian history. And uh, but yeah, being in the light and being in that kind of um, public, you know, you're everyone's aware of who you are is a it was a very wild experience. Um, and I definitely think it has a lot to do with me being active now because I mm -hmm. see so much going on in our political, you know, uh, situation right now that I know that I was taught that you got to stand up when things aren't right and you need to speak for the people that might not have a voice themselves and you got to get involved. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people have not been involved in politics for a really long time in our country. So, yeah, it's it's an interesting uh, background. And, and ironically, my maiden name is Common. So we used to have a, house, a sign on the house, on our house that said the House of Commons. So I look back on it all now and that's, I'm like, wow. That's brilliant. So Lana, you mentioned uh, being very active when you were young and and I see that uh, you're very uh, involved in, in health and sports and fitness. And in fact, uh, you became uh, uh, a, a very storied volleyballer at uh, Grant McEwen. And then you went on to study chiropractic and became a doctor there. Uh, and also a certified uh, trainer and wellness coach. How did you get led in that direction following your, your sports career? 
Yeah, well, growing up, um, my parents were a little bit hippie-ish, if you will. <laughs> I think my dad was trying to have a hand at like the farmer gym. And so we lived outside of Short Park on an acreage. My parents were very interested in, um, you know, natural health themselves. Mm -hmm. And so having a big garden, we had our own cattle and sheep and pigs. And so my parents didn't let me eat a lot of the not so fun things, right? Which in retrospect, I'm really thankful for now. Um, but yeah, you know, all of these little experiences in my life of growing up and then being um, an athlete I was involved in many many sports uh, but volleyball ended up being my my big passion uh, mm -hmm. but yeah just you know nourishing the body as an athlete is really important for performance right right and so health and natural wellness approaches were a big part of my life even from growing up um, it is interesting. My father actually uh, got cancer when he, when I was quite young. So I did get very exposed into Western medicine as well and watch that process of him going through his treatments and what have you. Mm -hmm. And it was another piece of the puzzle for me, you know, when it came time to what I wanted to do and how I wanted to, you know, be of service in my life. And I chose to look into uh, chiropractic and natural health and wellness. Um, you know, I looked at medicine as well. I had the grades. I could done either uh, but I really felt that there was just so much more to helping people truly and it was in line with my athletic background and all of the you know things about really keeping our bodies healthy and clean and powerful so so that's why I ended up doing that so mm -hmm. yeah going down that road and then speaking of going down the road you ended up in California for a dozen years and then you came back and you helped author a book called healing practices to help kids grow up easier why why did you come back to the frozen north after escaping to California. Right. Well, so I moved down there to go to chiropractic school and uh, I did fall in love with the area. I ended up practicing in wine country, California. I had a private practice. Um, it was called Soul Shine Family Chiropractic. And uh, I specialized with babies and kids and pregnant moms. It was always a big passion of mine to help children, especially. And I was really blessed to have some medical doctors actually reach out to me while I was in California and ask me to be a contributing author to that book to contribute the, the uh, chapter on chiropractic and how it can help children. And so it was a really big honor to be a part of that. Um, and yeah, wow, California. Um, well, my college sweetheart, who I met playing volleyball in Edmonton, he's a national champion Bears volleyball player from U of A. Um, oh. We synchronistically met in California and... Uh, here we are. I am back in my hometown and I'm married to my college sweetheart and that's why I'm here. I want to talk a little bit more about your work as a blood microscopist, as a scientist. Um, before we do that, I want to mention a few quotations from uh, some quote-unquote fringe doctors who happen to agree with you. One of them is Dr. Robert Malone, who was on this program recently. He said that what happens to confidence in public health uh, and the government, if ivermectin turns out to be safe and effective for COVID and the genetic vaccines turn out to have significant safety issues, this looks like a very plausible scenario from where I sit. That was from June of 2021. Uh, Dr. Martin Koldorf, Professor Martin Koldorf, uh, who's an epidemiologist, you probably know, he said this, people should be able to express their views freely in society, whoever they are, there's actually a lot of people who are not scientists who have very insightful thoughts about the pandemic. And one of the principles of public health, many of which have been thrown out the window during uh, the pandemic, is that you have to listen to the public. And finally, from Dr. Jay Bhattacharya, who's also a friend of this show, he said Anthony Fauci's performance has been an abdication of responsibility. So just framing that, tell us about your work as a blood microscopist and, and what are you learning about how these vaccines are impacting uh, human blood. Yeah. Well, so this, uh, I was really trying to look into a way that I could help people even further with mm -hmm. what, you know, some of the nutrition and background and supplementation and, you know, natural ways of living. Right. And, and so I was actually uh, exposed to a friend and she's now a friend of mine and my mentor who's a naturopath and also has been doing blood microscopy for almost 17 years. 
And I asked her, I'm like, wow, like this is so fascinating. I had heard about blood analysis. It's been used for a long, long time. Um, and I said, you know, could I do that? And could I take the schooling for that? And she's like, absolutely. And I think you should because of all your background that you have. So I chose to go back to school intensively and do that and uh, got myself a big fancy microscope, which I'd worked on, you know, in my early years uh, with some microscope work with my science background and also in chiropractic school. Uh, so I feel like I kind of went back to some of my roots with that but it, it has been unbelievable to look at the cells under the microscope you know I've, I've also been a real nerd my whole life <laughs> like I love school um you know I was one of my most proud things is not only was an, I an all Canadian for volleyball but I was an academic all Canadian which meant I held honors throughout my whole university degree and so I love science and I love the nerdy stuff and researching so it's something I've done my whole life so when you're studying the cell like that's the basic unit of life so to be able to take a little drop of blood from someone put it under the microscope look at it on the screen and show them what's going on and then to gather the insights on what's happening how the internal environment is is going to reflect on the outside if right. there's things that are not well on the inside, it is going to express on the outside. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it has been really incredible um, to look at that um, and alarming. Like you mentioned, I've seen some things that I have had to keep my calm because I'm like, that is shocking, shocking. Right. Yeah, you're you're part of something called um, True Health and, and Wellness, uh, which, as you say, it looks at health from the inside out. But I saw a couple of um, slides that you you posted on on Twitter, and these just look bizarre. Uh, yes. What what do you what do you I mean you're a scientist. What do you suppose is happening at at the molecular level in our blood uh, yeah. in reaction to these vaccines? Do you have any idea? Well, and I, that's a good point too, is like, we're still in an experiment. Like I remind people of that all the time. So we're learning. And I think that's another important thing when people are scientifically minded and they want to study things, you have to understand it's a process. Like I was taught that my whole life, right? And right. the point of science is to question, but yet in the last few years- Unless you're Dr. Fauci, because right. he is the seed of science. He is the science. <laughs> right. Don't question me. And again, that should have woken some people up too, because science is never settled. It's never right. settled. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, we're in an experiment and we're seeing different things and we're trying to understand what we are seeing. There is a lot of heavy metal um, particulates in people's blood, a lot of strangely colored crystals um, that we're seeing. Uh, also a lot of, um, parasitic organisms and very strange things that come together to form bigger structures. Uh, there, I've seen some things that look so almost like pine needles, like jagged, wow. like very rough and intense, like metallic, almost like glass shards and mm -hmm. big organized structures in people's blood. Um, and it's shocking. And at times I'm like, I don't even know what I'm looking at to be honest, mm -hmm. like I have sent this to my mentors and said, what is this? And mm -hmm. they've been studying this for 35 years, one mentor and another 17. And even they are like, whoa, like mm -hmm. these are things we've never seen before. Mm -hmm. So there's definitely unusual things. Um, there's also patterns with the immune system itself. And that's what I'm really trying to focus on is helping people to reclaim their health and be as radically healthy as you can and boost mm -hmm. your immune system big time. That's what we need to do right now. And unfortunately, you know, the injections and even the virus itself really, really assaulted people's immune system. So their white mm -hmm. blood cells and their homeland security, if you will. And unfortunately, the more and more, you know, boosters and injections people get, it appears that they have less and less white blood cells in their blood. So that means you're walking around with very little of your homeland security. And we're walking around in a slew of viruses and bacteria all the time. And that's what right. your immune system is for. We are mm -hmm. powerfully and fiercely and brilliantly made, right? right. But if we assault our, our immune systems, that is really challenging to recover from. So, but there are things we can do. And I'm trying to really focus on that, mm. you know, help people be strong and reclaim our health. 
So there is a way for, there are ways for people to boost their immune systems, even if they have taken the vaccinations, there are ways to improve uh, health, even, even in spite of having, uh, you know, let, let's say someone's had a, a very adverse reaction or is suffering from chronically poor health. There are things that they can do, the natural ways of, of improving health, even in that situation. Yeah, there are steps. Um, you know, it'll be a process of healing. I, I really, that's another thing I feel like people have forgotten is that healing is a process. So, you know, in our fast food nation, everybody wants healing yesterday. <laughs> we want things to be immediate. Like you want right. to lose weight yesterday. Well, that's not how it works. Um, right. It's going to be a process, but there are things you can do, you know, focusing on our diet, for instance, you know, eating as anti-inflammatory as we can, cutting out the things that aren't good for us, which most of us know what those are. It's just humans mm -hmm. tend not to do those things. Uh, right. but that is a really powerful way. And, and even, you know, accessing your food from people around you, like farmers markets and local farmers, like get good food sources is really powerful. And then there are some supplements and things that people can do to really um, decrease inflammation and, and mitigate some of the damage. Um, but again, we're in an experiment. Like, do we know how long the spike, pro uh, spike protein production happens? That's not, we don't totally know. Mm -hmm. We don't know all the fallout yet. Right. And I don't think we are going to know for a number of years, if not decades, we have, we don't truly know what the impact is on, for instance, fertility in young mm -hmm. children and kids, right? We've right. injected them now. We don't know. So, yeah. mm -hmm. so that, that this is. Part of part of being free, uh, I guess, at the individual level is being is being healthy, though, isn't it? That's part of taking back your freedom, is being free of uh, of of let's say um, uh, you know public health, where you're not reliant upon uh, medicine. Uh, you you where you 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 have a proper diet, you're getting exercise, you're getting your vitamin D or or things of that nature. That's a form of freedom too, isn't it? That's very important. People overlook that. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's some little things that people can do too. You know, I think the last few years have been enormously stressful for people on top of regular life stress. We've had this, like, you know, I tell my kids, I'm like, I never saw, I never thought that I'd be fighting global crime and they laugh at me. Right. <laughs> but it's very stressful. So the effects of that are major, but at the same time, I think it's really important for people to get reconnected with loved ones and be connected to community. Mm -hmm. They wanted us, you know, to socially distance, but that was actually social conditioning of separation. Like we need right. to come back. We need to hug, you know, we need to like get outside. We need to do things that bring us joy. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. I think the last three years sucked a lot of joy out of human beings. So we have to, again, don't play into that agenda do things that bring you joy, do things mm -hmm. that make you healthy. You're very difficult to control when you're healthy and strong. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's a big part of my message. You know, you just look at animals. It's unfortunately the young or the weak that will get, you know, eaten in nature. Right. right? So right. let's take care of our young and then let's all be healthy so that we are strong together. So yeah, yeah that's my definite focus. So, yeah. and I'd love in, across the country. And I know in Alberta where we're at, you know, there's some incredible groups forming like mm -hmm. food cooperatives and, you know, you have unity health in the Edmonton area and YYC rocks in the Calgary and Southern zone that are creating almost, I don't want to say alternatives. That's not the right way, but like a parallel healthcare that people can access, especially when they feel um, mistrustful, because let's mm -hmm. be honest, trust has been broken in, in for people right. in the mainstream medicine. So, right. um, you know, I know my dear friend, Sherry Strong, she's with the Children's Health Defense. Like her and I are uh, joining up together to do a traveling health road show through Alberta. So we're going to oh, hit great. Grand Prairie. Yeah, going to hit Grand Prairie soon. We're going to go to Lloyd. Um, we have already done one in Edmonton. Uh, you know, we're going to go all over the province and really empowering people on how they can reclaim their health and wellness. So there's great things oh, happening too. That's brilliant. That, that's exactly. I hope you're coming. Are you coming to Cold Lake perhaps? Maybe. We'll see. Okay. I've, I've never been to Cold Lake and it, it looks beautiful. So <laughs> yeah, you know, we'd love to have you there in the summertime. Dr. Dr. Thomas Soule of the Hoover Institute in the U.S. is for my money, one of the most brilliant uh, people in the world, he's an economist. He, he, he's written several books about racism. He's actually 
a, a 92-year-old black man who grew up in Harlem in the 1930s and 40s, so he knows something about real racism. He says yeah. racism today is a label that uh, is a simplistic label that we put on a bunch of problems that if we really were serious and thought hard enough about, we could actually do something to solve, right? Mm -hmm. So for example, I, when you talk about um, racism in the context of overpopulation of indigenous uh, men in, or, or women in Canada, uh, that's a simplistic label. We say, well, that's because of racism, but that slapping that label on it isn't helping anyone. Whereas if we went and we looked at things like poverty, if we looked at fatherlessness, if we looked at, uh, you know, the, 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 even things like water and availability of, of, uh, of, of daily bread on reserves, we might be able to do something about all those problems if we really thought about them when we really wanted to work on them. And so racism is sort of, that's his description. I think that's the best definition of racism there is. Because yeah. you can call someone a racist, but once you do that and you give them their label, who have you helped? Exactly. Nobody, right? I, yeah. That is so, oh, I thanks for sharing that with me because I think yeah. that's bang on. And, and, you know, to me, what popped in my head as well, <laughs> pardon me, is, you know, even in the kind of an analogy for me would be Western medicine loves to slap a label on people, right? Like you right. get a diagnosis or like, this mm -hmm. is what you have. Okay. But why is that happening? And what do I do about it? Right. That's the most important piece yeah. that is so lacking in healthcare and clearly in society, like you just described. So yeah. these things are symptoms of these bigger causes underneath that people really got to dive into if we want to make yep. a shift and a change. And we could solve them if we really tried, if we really were Absolutely. serious about it. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, this has been wonderful, uh, uh, Lana. Um, on our program, we have something called a reading list. Uh, so I'm going to ask you to maybe think of uh, uh, of a book or two that you think would be useful or inspiring to people watching this podcast. I'm going to go first to give you a little bit of time to collect okay. your thoughts. Uh, and I have a couple of books that uh, you've probably you've probably heard of. Uh, one is called uh, Canada's COVID: The Story of a Pandemic Moral Panic. This this one just came out recently, actually. Uh, and this book deals with the political and social dimensions of the reaction to COVID-19, the moral panic accompanying and compounding the medical and public health responses to COVID remains a prominent feature of Canadian public policy, even after three years. And this book explores the question of why policymakers persist in promoting fear, which you talked about today. And so that's one book. The second one is, uh, is called The New Abnormal. The Rise of the Biomedical Security State. This book was published last November. It's by um, a doctor named Aaron uh, Cariardi. He was an MD. And uh, here, this book says that the coronavirus pandemic conferred enormous power on certain government officials, as we know, uh, and they have no intention of giving it up, which is also clear. And in this chilling book, a dissident scientist reveals the people and organizations that form the biomedical security state uh, the role uh, in the origin of the pandemic and shaping the government response that this played, why it is a threat to science, public health, and individual freedom. So those are a couple of recommendations that uh, we've made based upon uh, who you are and, and what you're doing. Are there any, any books or, or other sources of information, a website or anything like that, that you might want to point uh, people to that, that you think that uh, might, be, might be useful to them and in furthering their understanding of some of the things that we've been talking about today? Yeah. Well, and I'm often like reading multiple different subjects, right? And I pick them up depending on my mood, things like that. I love to read. Uh, but, you know, a couple ones that I'm reading right now, and you pro I'm sure you've heard of this one, but The Psychology of Totalitarianism. Oh, yes. Uh, the assessment. Yeah. So I'm partway through it, um, you know, but it's helped me to understand and also have more compassion for people around mm -hmm. me with mm -hmm. the choices that they made. Because when you have constant bombardment of marketing and propaganda and this free floating fear and anxiety that you feel like you don't have control of, you know, right. it's amazing what can be done to manipulate a human being's mind. Uh, mm -hmm. So that is an eye opener. And I think it's very powerful read. Um, another one, I'll just uh, kind of share a local author that I, is just wonderful. His name is Donald Lee. 
and his book is called what the hell is going on he's a <laughs> great title <laughs> yeah so it's a great book and uh so just to share that um would love to you know just plug him because he's an amazing man and he wrote this book and poured his heart into it as well um another one that is really eye-opening for health and wellness is actually from someone who was a mentor of mine and, and was one of my instructors when i was in chiropractic school but Bruce Lipton, The Biology of Belief, and he is an mm. epigeneticist. So studying what actually triggers certain genes to turn on and not turn on and how our environment and the thoughts that we think actually control uh, the expression of our life and our health. So that's a really powerful one. Well, that's great. Thanks for those. They'll all be added to our uh, reading list. Uh, incidentally, um, we actually had uh, Dr. Eric Payne on mm -hmm. this program, and he was talking about, I was really, really uh, just blown away to hear him talk about how genes can be turned on and turned off now yes. uh, so that they can be either, you know, either suppressed or, or accentuated. Really That's just great. incredible, incredible stuff. And of course, very dangerous and horrifying in the, in the wrong, in the wrong hands, you know, That's it's almost great. like a Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Uh, if you think, if, yeah. if it's put in the, in the wrong perspective in the wrong hands. Well, anyway, that's why there was supposed to be um, laws and protection against bioweapons, right? Is for that yeah. exact reason. So um, mm -hmm. it is alarming. So yeah. yeah. And, and wow, Dr. Payne is someone I greatly respect. That, but yes. He's yes. He's a, he's a big brain. There's no yes. question about it. Um, this has been just great. Uh, I'm so, I'm so grateful for your, for your time and for visiting with us today. We've learned a lot about you and what you're doing. And uh, I think it's very inspiring for people. I hope it is for the people who watch, uh, who watch our show to know there are people out there like you who are just so dedicated to working on behalf of uh, Albertans and all Canadians in the cause of, of health and freedom, which really uh, are inextricable. And uh, so thank you so much for being our special guest today, Dr. Nickel. Oh, my pleasure. And, you know, if anyone wants to find me, they can find me on cellfood.ca with a couple other nurses in Alberta that are doing similar to what I'm doing. Um, and then we actually, just to share, we're working on a national directory of people who do the live and dried cell blood analysis and microscopy oh, across great. the country so that people can um, find someone who can help them in their area. So we'll we'll get that together and have it on, on our website uh, very soon so you can get yeah. help that you need to. Yeah, I'll just mention too, if people are, are interested, they should visit your 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 Twitter page and look at some of these uh some of these slides that you have there. It uh it, it really is uh it really is bizarre. It looks more like a like a Vincent van Gogh painting than than something that should be in people's blood. Yes. So um yeah, anyway, thanks a, so much. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and you don't have to have much education though to know, like in in that specific topic, to know that that's not supposed to be in our blood. <laughs> no, it's sort of like Sesame Street. One of these things, it's not like the other. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Well, thanks. Thanks again for being with us. Thank you so much, Leighton, and keep up your great work. I'm so thankful for you. 